Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of TheMindRenewed.com, coming to you as usual from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And today I'm very pleased to welcome back to the programme Mike Hopkins, co-host of Fight the Lies Radio, which you can find at ftlradio.com. Dot net. Uh, many of you will remember that Mike joined us back in 2016, yes, it was that long ago, um, to share his experience and indeed his wife's experience of leaving a Christian congregation involved in the so-called New Apostolic Reformation. And if you're not familiar with the NAR movement, as it's often referred to, um, I do re- recommend you to go back through the TMR archives and listen to that particular interview. And to make it easy, I've got a note of it here. It's number TMR number 100. And 53. Um, and of course, today we're going to be speaking about a different subject, um, which is conspiracy theories and the Christian. So there we are. But more of that, of course, in just a moment. Mike, good to be speaking to you again. How are you doing? It's good to be speaking with you. I'm quite well. Excellent. Um, since we last spoke on air, I understand that you changed your job. How is that going? You, you work in the tech industry, don't you? Yes. Um, well, I worked for a company that is very, very large. They're global. And uh, many of us became dissatisfied with the security we had with that employer as there were a lot of layoffs and a lot of changes you see in the corporate world today. Um, a lot of companies follow the lead of Google and how they do things. But unfortunately, not in some of the good aspects you hear about, like Google lets you bring your dog to work and things like that. We didn't have any of that. So, oh, dear. (laughs) (laughs) It would have been a happy there. But so uh, Kayla missed out. I told you I was going to mention the name of your dog. (laughs) Missed out on not having Kayla there. Let me tell you, she's a character. Uh But uh, yeah, so it kind of led me to an uncomfortable state of decision. And actually, as I've told you before, Hmm. your podcast episode from a few months ago when you did the move with your parents, had some of your just thoughts on the change and leaving and never seeing that place again. It was very much where I was at at the time. So it helped me a bit sort it out and work through it and say, okay, you you know what? It's time to move on. Great. So, um, yeah, the new company, it's, I can't say a lot about it because we work as a direct contractor for the government. So you're limited okay. in what you could yeah, say. Yeah. And, um, okay. No, fair, fair enough. <laughs> Don't feel you, you have to say anything much about it, but, um, you did say to me when we had our pre-interview chat that you were a bit concerned about the level of bureaucracy in, in this new job. Um, well, the actual location I work at, the people are great. It's very relaxed, very friendly, almost family-like. Yeah. Uh, but just the way things are done when you are doing work for the government, every I has to be dotted, every T crossed. Um, everything has to be accounted for uh, down to like each and every screw. So if a screw costs <laughs> six cents, that six cents has to be accounted for. Say you lose that six cent screw, you have to then report it to your lead. And that's after you're doing the um, the required uh, paperwork, so to speak, on the computer for nonconformists and for a material request, right? So you're spending time doing that, and you get that to your lead, who then has to examine it and decide whether, okay, the screw is really needed. Then he has to fill out paperwork, send it to a manufacturing engineer who has to examine it and give it <laughs> approval. And then compare it against standards. And then he has to send that to somebody else in an administrative position who then has to write off on it, who then sends it back to the material engineer, who then sends it back to your lead, who then sends it to the uh, stock person. And then they have to process it and then submit a request. And then it finally works its way back to you. And, you know, best case scenario, you might have two days, you might have two weeks. So at the end of the entire process, that six cent screw average cost about fifty dollars. <laughs> Great government efficiency. Does it uh, turn you into an anarchist by any chance, or <laughs> make make you move in that direction? Perhaps <laughs> I already was in that direction quite a few years ago, so no interest in going back there. But uh, I, I find it sometimes frustrating and sometimes very comical. Yeah. And the moral of the story is, for me, is do not drop that screw. (laughs) Yeah, good point. Don't start it off in the first place. Okay, so um, let's get down to the subject at hand. So we're going to be talking to uh, about, um, what did I call it, conspiracy theories and the Christian. Or more specifically, should 
a Christian believe in conspiracy theories? Now, that might seem a little odd for me to be asking a question like that, given the fact that The Mind Renewed fairly regularly deals with matters like that. But the reason why I am putting up this question for discussion is because, as many people will be aware, there are writers and speakers, including ministers of religion, who do maintain that Christians should not believe in conspiracy theories. I've come across many articles that have said such things. You know, that there's something, I suppose, um, foolish or irrational, blameworthy, uh, disreputable um, about believing in conspiracy theories. Now, that raises, in my mind, a whole load of questions some of which I hope we will be able to discuss today, um, some of which we will have already discussed on TMR, but some of them will be new, because although we have talked about the concept of conspiracy theories over the years, we haven't specifically addressed the relationship between conspiracy theories and the Christian believer. And this is something that I've, I've really wanted to do for quite a while, because uh, TMR is sort of half conspiracy related and half Christian theology related. So it seemed like a, a good idea to fit the two together, especially this is this is going to be put out as TMR number 200. So uh, it's um, an ideal marriage there between those two concepts. Um, so I'm going to kick this off with a few thoughts about this. So the question is, should a Christian believe in conspiracy theories? Now, that sounds like one question, but I'm going to sort of tease that apart into lots of other questions that I think are lurking under the surface there, Mike, for our discussion. So here are just a few of my thoughts. Well, what is a conspiracy theory anyway? What do we even mean by that? And then that obviously breaks down into two parts. What's a conspiracy and what is a theory? Um, what is it about conspiracy theorizing, even if we can define what that means? What is it about that that is especially problematic? What are people criticizing here? Is it different from other theories? Why should it be different from other theories? Um, I think we need to discuss a deeper question, such as what does it mean even to believe in a conspiracy theory. What does it mean to believe anything? Are we talking about 100% confidence? Are we talking about degrees of confidence? These things are unspoken. And I think we can go further, and we will do. Uh, what does the word shouldn't mean here? That sounds like some kind of warning. Is it a moral warning? Is it a logical warning? Uh, is it a pastoral warning? Um, as I say, these things are not stated. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to tease some of these things apart and um, bring some light onto this general warning that I think is rather uncritically thrown out there by various writers. Should a Christian believe in the conspiracy theories? And of course, the rhetorical answer to that is no, you shouldn't. No, we shouldn't. So let's start right at the uh, beginning with this. What are conspiracy theories? And as I said before, we've got two parts. We've got conspiracy and we've got theory. So Mike, I'm going to throw this to you now and see where this goes. How would you define a conspiracy? Well, a conspiracy classically would be defined as two or more people agreeing upon a goal or agenda secretly and then implementing it either in a veiled way or sometimes in an open way. But the idea is they do not want others to know they are working together to reach that goal. And the goal is reprehensible in some way. That's what we, we normally think of, don't we? Illegal or immoral, that sort of thing. Typically, though, sometimes you could conspire with somebody to surprise a friend for their birthday. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I haven't thought of that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's sort of a very normal, common human thing. Mm -hmm. It's just two people secretly agreeing upon a goal. Absolutely. Okay, well, I'm saying I, th I think that's the easy part of it. So here we get straight into the meat of this um, theory. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly don't want us to start playing semantic games here, but... Um, I think that a lot of people, when they're thinking about various things that have happened in the world and trying to interpret what's going on, people are dealing with hypotheses rather than theories because theories tend to be something a bit more established. Um, it's trying to understand what's going on and saying, is it this? And being open, perhaps, hopefully anyway, to correction. Um, is that what you reckon people are doing, making hypotheses about things? Well, I certainly do. And I know I myself, as I've grown older and wiser, I'm very much more careful about what I say and the conclusions I draw. Hmm. If I don't have evidence, if I don't have anything other than my own thoughts, putting A and B together and coming to a conclusion, which is actually, as you say, more of an hypothesis, then, uh, you know, should I really be talking about those things? So, yeah, I, I agree 
that most often what we see and as this sort of discussion has exploded over the years, because back in the 80s and 90s, talk about conspiracies was very, very low key. It was very much relegated to, you know, closed rooms and the dark corners of the pre-internet yeah. and late night radio shows. And books no one ever heard of. <laughs> yes. but today, you know, it's everywhere. A lot of people jumping on the bandwagon. Mm. And that is one of the issues I have is a lot of people putting out a lot of hypotheses without any sort of evidence. And therefore, not really being open to correction, I suppose. If you're putting out a hypothesis not based upon evidence, then no contrary evidence can really have much effect on your idea, can it? No, not at all. And then, of course, whether you're talking about an individual or an organization, once you've put a big amount of effort into that theory, then it becomes sort of your identity and people do not want to have to question their identities. So would you agree then that actually forming kind of loose hypotheses about things that are going on in the world, you know, you hear something on the news or whatever it is, and it strikes you as this is very odd, this doesn't make sense to me. And so you try to understand, you, you look into the issue that's going on, and you therefore form a hypothesis about what you think might possibly be going on. And this is as a Christian, can you think there's anything wrong with that? What is wrong with that? Well, on one hand, I don't think there's really necessarily anything wrong with it. I think it's healthy. I think it's an intelligent thing to do. I mean, if you don't do that, then what are you doing? You're just being spoon-fed what you are to think and just embracing that. So in that sense, hey, nothing wrong with it. But I think that once we start repeating that hypothesis, that's where you get into that danger zone that it may indeed be something that's wrong. If you're repeating it to someone else who understands, hey, this is a hypothesis, it's nothing that we can prove, and you have a discussion with that second person, hey, that's normal, that's healthy, that's part of the process. Mm. Uh, I, I, can I just butt in there? Because I think you're absolutely right that this is one of the dangers with this scene that these ideas can come to have a life of their own. And this is one of the criticisms that's leveled against those of us who are involved in this style of thinking is that we can have a hypothesis and we can put it out there and then it can almost become impervious to contrary evidence. I think there is some truth in that criticism. I'm not, I'm not saying, therefore, it's wrong to think about these things, but I think you have pointed out a, a significant danger there. Well, I think we always have to be aware of that possibility and aware of what we're saying. And as they say, things go viral on the Internet, and one does not have a better example than the flat Earth theory. I mean, <laughs> look how that's exploded based on, and we won't go into that unless you want to, but that's exploded based on no evidence, people repeating a hypothesis just based upon these interpretations of what they see. You know, now they're having conferences and everything else. And, of course, the real danger for us as Christians when we start talking about these things is the world they want ammunition to use against us. They want things to be able to mock Christianity and God and the Bible and everything else with. So Absolutely. for us as yeah. Christians, I believe we need to be even more careful about what we put out there because, mm -hmm. I mean, of course, we're held to a higher standard in so many ways. And as we relate yeah. to the world, we should hold ourselves to a higher standard because, again, the world – the world system is looking for that sort of thing to say, ha, look at those Christians. Yes. Look at the fools they are. They think the uh, earth's flat and it's on the back uh, of a giant turtle. <laughs> I, I absolutely, indeed. Um, and I don't want to get into that issue because, as you know, uh, we did actually cover that at one point, And uh, it was one of those subjects that did actually you know, upset a few people. But that's the way things go. But I totally agree with you. Uh, this admonition that we should not be involved in conspiracy theories, I think it's probably right for us to at least learn something from it. And what you have said is, I think, a helpful response that we should be very self-critical. We should be, we should be averse really to wanting to talk about these things and averse to wanting to share these things too much, unless we have a really high degree of certainty about what we're talking about. And this is one of the, the things that I do with the mind renewed. I think 
some people are perplexed as to why there are all sorts of subjects that I don't cover. I mean, they will send me suggestions and I have asked, please do send suggestions into the show. And I'm very grateful for all the suggestions that come in. But I think there is some sense that some people are perplexed by the fact that I don't pick up on a lot of things. And that is because I'm not really out there looking for as many conspiracy theories as I mean, I'm not really looking for conspiracy theories. What I generally find is that I'm simply existing as a human being and then things hit me often in the news and they don't make sense to me. They cause a sense of indignation. I, I, I think oh, there's no way I can believe that. You've got to be kidding. You do think I'm an idiot. And it's, it's that kind of reaction that then makes me want to go and find out what's really going on. And I tend to go to sources that I trust. And then I form some sort of judgment about it. But I'm not going out there thinking, well, now I've got a show next week. What am I going to do about that? Let's go down the list of conspiracy theories. And I do tend to think that is a bit irresponsible, really. But people do do that. They must do that. I definitely think they do. I mean, there's a bit of pragmatism quite often in some of the podcasting community of we've got to find something to keep the show going. We've got to maintain and grow our audience and all those different things. So, you know, just... Because of that, there is a tendency in the realm of shows who do the conspiracy type of topics to always be looking for the next conspiracy or something to back up the one you had previously presented. And let me just say, um, I sound like I'm being very critical, but I do believe, for the record, that us as Christians should expect there to be conspiracies because, I mean, that's what the picture the Bible paints for us is that there are conspiracies behind the scene. I mean, Revelation is a a very, (laughs) paints a very big picture of that. So I think we should not be shocked as Christians that there are these sorts of things that maybe we can't prove with empirical evidence necessarily, but that there are Mm -hmm. these things on behind the scenes that major world events perhaps may have an orchestration behind them. So, again, not at all opposed to putting these things out there. I mean, I researched and talked about these things for years before the Internet was the Internet. But uh, I guess just as I've grown older and I've experienced my own sorts of uh, self-corrections, I've I've grown a bit more measured in what I decide that I agree with and what I do feel is appropriate to talk about. And for the record as well. I want to say that that's one of the reasons I have loved The Mind Renewed. When I discovered the show, I found it refreshing that there was a conversation happening about these sorts of things, but yet it was done in a responsible sort of way, which unfortunately does tend to be rather lacking at times. Well, thanks very much for saying that. And in fact, when I then listened to your show about this issue, I sensed the same thing with you. You remember the one that you did that I was particularly taken with because I thought you were being very responsible about it as well. So we shall pat each other on the back on this one. (laughs) Um, You also brought up there some issues to do with um, epistemology. You know, the theory of knowledge as to how we can actually know whether A is true or B is true. And you, you very helpfully there brought up an issue to do with, well, Christians may believe in things which may not be possible to show that it's true in an empirical way. You mentioned, you know, revelation and some of the things that that, that are taught in scripture. Well, you know, how do you prove that those things are going on behind the scenes or those things are going to transpire in the future? You can't. So I actually want to come back to that because I think that's a very important issue to look at because um, a lot of people talk about critical thinking, so we always use logic and reason, and they, which is absolutely fine, but they rarely talk about worldview. And I think that is an important thing we need to look at. I'll come back to that in a minute. I mean, one of the things that I notice is I actually think that a lot of people are simply asking questions rather than actually forming hypotheses. They're just saying, well, look, I don't understand this. How, how can that be the case? How can this be the case? And I think a lot of people do actually leave it at that. Not everybody, of course. But I have noticed that even that has been picked up by the establishment as something to criticize. And and I've read a number of articles where they will say, oh, you see these conspiracy theorists, they say, oh, we're only asking questions, but really they want a distorted view of reality, etc. I mean, do you think that that kind of criticism where we're we're told we can't even ask questions, I mean, it's obviously not a justified response, but I mean, do you think that's a bit of social engineering going on there to say that even if you have have a thought about something that's unconventional, you must 
You must silence that thought. Oh, I absolutely do. It smacks of 1984 and, and all the sort of <laughs> ideas that Orwell presented there. I mean, yeah. to say that one cannot think and question yes. things that are happening in our world, I mean, that's insane. And it's oppressive in every sense of the word. I mean, my own personal example in that is in my former congregation that you mentioned earlier, in my final confrontation, I was told that I needed to stop researching, questioning, and looking at things, you know, in general, and that I needed to just listen to what I was told and, and go along with the status quo. Yeah. In so many words, that's what was said. And I mean, that just completely flies in the face of everything I believe in. I think as long as we're alive and as long as we're thinking, as long as we're honest with ourselves and others, we should be questioning things. Uh, was, it, was that because they didn't want you to question the teachings of the leadership or was it something broader than that? Well, it was that, but it was broader than that. It was because I had begun to question people and teachings that the leadership had embraced. Therefore, it meant that I questioned them and I was questioning their identity and all those different things. Mm. So therefore, don't research those people and those movements because you are, in effect, questioning us when you do that. Right. You need to just listen to our judgment on that. Yeah. And I bring up that personal example because I think it, it was very much a, a nanny state sort of mentality that we do see, as you mentioned, in the world at large with the media and with the government and everything else. And if, you know, when you begin to question things, you are labeled as crazy, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. as if it's crazy to even begin to question the official narrative. Yeah. I mean, that means they've defined the official narrative and the media outlets presenting it as that's the definition of sanity. That's the definition of rationality. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you know? it, and it's really, really interesting that you, you say that your, that your previous leadership that you were involved with had that kind of attitude. Um, because I had exactly the opposite attitude from the previous minister that we had here in our church. It was obviously a completely different situation, but that particular minister I thought had a much more biblically sound attitude because I remember him saying to me that although he was there to bring me teaching as a leader, I, as a member of that congregation, was also there to hold him to account. And I was having a conversation with him about the Trinity, actually. Um, and I knew that he had a, he tended to have a rather liberal view of things. So I wanted to see how far that went. So I wanted to ask him about the divinity of Christ. And he, he answered in the affirmative. He did believe that Christ is divine. Um, but in that conversation, he said, you know, that that was right. You were right to do that. You're right to ask me that because you need to hold me to account. And I thought that was really refreshing, quite the opposite kind of mentality to what you, you're describing here. <laughs> yeah, it definitely was. I mean, that's what Paul praised the Bereans for, right? Yes. I mean, we as Christians should, we have a measuring stick. You know, we have something to compare what we're being told to. And unfortunately, in Christianity today, and I don't want to go off on a rabbit trail, but we've essentially removed that measuring stick and we've mm. replaced it with another. And that is men and their own interpretations and their own opinions, mm. their own so-called revelations. Those are now the new measuring sticks in so many places, which me making that statement, it sounds insane and it sounds unbelievable, but that's at least what I've experienced and what I've observed and heard from so many others. Yeah. I mean, turn on the television today or mm. any other outlet that has a so-called Christian network on television or whatever, you know, they have their own, <laughs> they have their own <laughs> select words of God, they would claim. And if you question that, you're in effect questioning the word of God. That's why we That's have a measuring stick called the Bible. Totally agree with you. And actually for every non-Christian out there listening, I can tell you that when I see Christianity represented on the TV, I am usually highly embarrassed by what I see. Uh, it doesn't seem to reflect uh, certainly the way that I understand Christianity to be in, in many cases. And I will say that often includes songs of praise as well, which I think is so wet in the way it presents Christianity. Um, one of the things that you said in the conversation we had last time was that the congregation that you were in involved in before did seem to have a great identification with the state, a sense of civil religion. And this is one of the things that I've picked up with this whole criticism of people who entertain conspiracy theories, is the idea that actually forming hypotheses and ideas about conspiracies in general is okay, so long as you don't criticize the state. 
So if you're perhaps suspecting a conspiracy uh, amongst ordinary citizens carrying out a crime, or perhaps even a corporation carrying out a, a crime in secret, well, that, that that's okay. That's kind of on this line of the respectability uh, spectrum. But as soon as you start talking about perhaps your own government or its institutions being involved, then you've crossed the line into conspiracy theory in this negative sense. Did you pick up any of that with respect to your previous experience? Oh, absolutely. I'll give you a really good example. Okay. You could have the leadership present something like, say, Hollywood as being there's this conspiracy to to destroy the Bible in the in American society. There's this conspiracy to erode faith in God and all these different things. There's conspiracy to corrupt our youth and all these different things. Those sorts of ideas would be talked about, presented from the pulpit, conversed about in off times and all of that. But me, as somebody who came in – now, I, I began going there in 2005. Someone who came in as – Oh, what everyone tends to call a 9-11 truther. Yeah. yeah. Because I analyzed things immediately. I mean, on the same day it happened, I began analyzing things. And I found things that just convinced me within a week, personally at least, that there was a lot more going on than what we were told. You were asking questions, essentially. Yes. Hmm. So when I went in there, one of the first things I heard early on was that if you questioned 9-11, you know, the facts – quote facts we were told, then you were in rebellion. Mm-hmm. You were essentially uh, crazy. Wow. And so there was That's absolutely it. a refusal to engage in such wow. topics. And I even a couple times here and there had sort of carefully tried to put my toe in the water and testing that by bringing up the topic in conversations. And let me tell you, that was some hot water. <laughs> it did not go Right, well. right. So, so the whole civil religion thing, then, as far as your experience of the U.S. Apostolic Reformation thing, is very strong in that movement. Yeah, and I, I will give you what my theory is as to why, amongst so many, it is an unquestionable thing. And that is because in America, there has been this foundational teaching laid out in those circles that the founding of America, going back to Jamestown, coming up through the Revolutionary War and everything else, that it was basically divinely orchestrated, that it was divine providence, that God wanted the U.S. government created, that God sanctioned the founding of America and all those things. And of course, as, as a believer, I do believe divine providence plays a massive role in our world, mm-hmm. both personally and at national levels. But God doesn't, you know, necessarily control and manipulate circumstances. I mean, there's human free will involved. Mm. Anyways, I don't want to wrap it. But you don't, you don't understand America as a messianic nation, presumably. No. And, no. you know, that's, again, people get into, <laughs> when you start talking about that, people get into things about, uh, what was his name? Jonathan Kahn, who wrote the book that got a lot of attention about 9-11 and, and tying it into uh, Isaiah and um, all these things. And a lot of people questioned, and this is a Messianic rabbi, by the way, a lot of people questioned, well, wait a minute, when I read this book, it sounds like replacement theology, which sounds very bizarre coming from a Messianic rabbi. But anyways, my wife read it and critiqued it for some people, but she had that same conclusion that that seems to be what it was getting at. But it was... uh, not to rabbit trail once again. The point <laughs> on that was that, yes, there is this sort of flavor of America being this end times fulfillment of biblical prophecy and that America is somehow in the dominionist sort of thought, America is going to be the kingdom that stands against the kingdom of the Antichrist. I mean, none of that's biblical. It sounds ridiculous to even talk about because it's like, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense because that's not what you read in Revelation. Yeah. Uh, you know, the entire world is spun out of control in Revelation. There is no great good nation standing against the darkness. But mm. that is essentially what they believe. So therefore, mm. that's my long, drawn-out way of getting back to why it's unacceptable to question the government in America in those circles. 
Yeah. And indeed, as we had a conversation with Martin, Dr. Martin Erdman about that, I think it was last year, specifically about civil religion and the fact that it's everywhere. But of course, it's more uh, obvious to us living in, in the West in our own countries and the like. Um, and he was pointing out that the neocons actually have played upon this a great deal because obviously they want people to identify with the state and they want to use anything that's within religion to force and encourage that identification with the state so that, of course, they can get people to go along with whatever the state chooses to do. Um, and I think that's alive and well at the moment, isn't it? I think with Trump, that seems also to be played out through him, doesn't it? It does, and well, that could be all kinds of rabbit trails. With yeah, yeah. I, I'm still- yeah we, we, I'll just let people into this. We keep on mentioning the rabbit trail because when we before we started this conversation, we we noted that this conversation could go anywhere and everywhere and do so really fast. So <laughs> um, that's what we're referring uh, to. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, I mean, I, I, yeah. Trump. It seems like it's it's really hard to nail him down. He seems to go in both directions. And I think that's probably just part of who he is. The guy's, you know, he's a businessman. Yeah. He, he does things pragmatically, whatever gives the best payoff, the best uh, results for the corporation. You know, there's that sure. sort of thinking, I think, going on in a lot of ways. But he definitely has a lot of neocons connected to him. Yeah. Do you reckon they're playing him like a puppet? You know, if I'm being an optimist, I would say yes, because my pessimistic side wants – to say, well, he's just, you know, he's in on it and he knows exactly what's going on. Yeah. Um, I tend to want to lean toward the optimistic view that I think perhaps he's just a bit ignorant to a lot of things and he's going <laughs> along with advisors. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do agree that he does seem extremely difficult to interpret. And one of the things I put to Paul Craig Roberts when I last spoke to him, and I think at the time before was that, you know, may- maybe, as you say, it's possible that Trump was in on it from the beginning. But Paul Craig Roberts seems to think, and was very definite about it, actually, that he wouldn't have been. He's, he's not a political animal in that sense. He uh, he comes from a strictly business background, and he doesn't really understand the machinations uh, that he's involved with. I suppose I'm being optimistic as well, but that seems to make sense to me. But one of the things that really concerns me is the way I see so many Christians putting their hope, particularly in America, of course, putting their hope in Trump, that somehow he is to be trusted, that he is a great hope. And I just have this definite sense that in that respect, the neocons that he's surrounded with are saying, yeah, look, we can see that influence that we have through him and we can wield that to our benefit. Do you think I'm right in thinking that? I think you're quite right in thinking that. I think it's always a very dangerous, slippery slope. Mm. We have done that in America Going back a very long time, but a very good example was George Bush Jr., George W. Yeah. You know, he came on the scene professing to be this great Christian, and he was going to go against the tide that we had of, you know, leftist liberalism here in America and go against all these things that the Clintons had done. And, you know, 9-11 happens and everybody just jumps on board that much more strongly because he's going to go get the bad guys. And, you know, all of our suspicions aside. Right. Because, you know, we both have our opinions about mm-hmm. 9 11. Um, by the time you get to the end of his presidency, you know, he's given speeches about all paths are valid paths to God and, <laughs> and talking about the angel on the whirlwind, which, if you research the angel mm-hmm. on the whirlwind, the only figure identified as such, from what I'm aware of, is a figure that you read about in. Kabbalah named Metatron, which they claim was uh, Enoch from Genesis. After he was left the earth, he became God transformed him into this angel. And in occult thought, he is like the divine messenger to humanity and gives us all the secret knowledge and all this stuff. <laughs> so, George, so it might have more, more to do with skull and bones than it has to right do with Christianity. To this figure and then no. his wife comes out as very hardcore pro-abortion by the end of his presidency. And my point being to all that is Christians in America just jumped on wholeheartedly behind George W. Bush. And if you, as somebody like me, questioned anything, you were, man, you were almost in the camp with the Antichrist, right? Absolutely. So it is a very, very powerful tool that can be wielded. And we, we need to be very careful of it. I mean, the example you've just given, I think, is ideal there. So it's absolutely right, isn't it, to entertain thoughts of suspecting one's government of 
conspiracy in itself. There's nothing wrong with that. If you have grounds for that, why is it different from anything else? It seems to me that it's just these social taboos, these artificial prohibitions that are placed there around us that would stop us thinking in rational terms about such matters. What, what is the, I suppose it's this idea of exceptionalism, but what grounds do we have to think that America or indeed Britain is exceptional? I don't see, I don't see that we have grounds for that. No, I don't think so. I mean, human history is littered with examples of governmental conspiracy. Mm. I mean, I was going to say going back to ancient Rome, but you can go back much further than that. But I mean, ancient Rome, look at Rome. I mean, there were conspiracies left and right. That's how you went from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire. Mm. We don't look back at those historical instances and say that's crazy to talk about. <laughs> I mean, no, 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 after it's a long time ago, yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. But of course, this is another point, isn't it? That uh, this is one of the things that I've mentioned this a few times, actually, Charles Pigden, who is a New Zealand philosopher and has been thinking as an analytical philosopher about the business of conspiracy theorizing. And I did actually, I wanted to speak to him, but um, and I was in contact with him and he was interested but for some reason, you know, there were family things going on and it just sort of didn't happen. But he wrote about this kind of thing. And one of the things he pointed out was that we're all too happy to believe that conspiracies happen in other nations. And in fact, our government itself is happy to encourage us to think that conspiracies happen in other nations, but we're not supposed to think it about our own. That in itself, I think, should tell us something. That is something that government itself is encouraging in order to inoculate itself from criticism, isn't it? Yeah, I would definitely agree I think part of it's basic human nature, too. One does not want to question their own household security. You know, you can look at someone else's house and say, wow, they're a mess. Mm. But to look at your own, people don't want to do that because then it means yes. I have to question what I place my security in. And so I think yes. on a very yes. fundamental human level, we have that tendency. And I do believe that government does play on our base fundamental human qualities. Yeah. That's the easiest thing to do, after all. Yeah. Okay, so let me throw this at you, Mike. But doesn't Paul say in Romans 13 that we must obey the authorities? Does that not sort of set in stone this idea that, well, we must obey, we must trust, and therefore we mustn't question? I don't believe that, obviously, but I'm just giving you the chance there to respond to that. Well, that's one I'm quite familiar with. I don't know how <laughs> much I can exposit on it, but that was one of the very verses that was always shot at us when we began, anybody began to talk about mm -hmm anything that questioned the official narrative. And, and this is in my former congregation. Yeah. One of the obvious takeaways from that is that should, for one thing, be interpreted as Paul framed it, and that is as long as that government is not telling you to go against God in any sort of way. Sure. He actually said something like the authorities are there to do good or something like that, to do you good. So there is this implication that the authorities in respect of whatever it is you're talking about is actually try the authorities are trying to do the good in that issue. Yes. And the other thing is context, context, context. Yes. And the context of the government that Paul was speaking of was government as mandated by God to protect the people, to, you know, secure its borders, all those different things. Yeah. Government biblically speaking, was not mandated to do all these different things that we see government do today. So yeah. in one sense, I guess simply you could say as long as government is fulfilling its mandate and is operating in the context biblically prescribed, then you as a Christian should not go against it. Yeah, and I take that point. Um, and in fact, what people often bring up is Acts 4, isn't it, where the apostles are actually told by the authorities in Jerusalem, so we might say that's the government, they're the religious authorities in Jerusalem, that they should not preach in the name of Jesus Christ. And they go out and preach in the name of Jesus Christ. So there's, uh, there is an example of disobeying the authorities because what the authorities are doing at that time is against the will of God. Although I'm quite sure that Paul, because of his worldview, w would actually say those authorities are there as a consequence, you know, of God's sovereign superintending of all things. Now, of course, that would then be a very deep theological discussion as to how to make sense of that. But, um, and I think one could make sense of that. I think there are lots of theological tools to cope with that. Um, but nevertheless, we have an example there of on the ground actually going against what an authority says, even though Paul can say, when the authorities are there to do you good, you should obey them. 
Uh, one thought that comes to my mind that I'll just throw out there as well is a point many have made here in America is that the authority, properly speaking, in America is the Constitution as set up by the, quote, founding fathers. So those currently in seats of power in the government are supposed to be there to fulfill the mandates of the Constitution, to follow that Constitution and make sure that the American people are able to live within the boundaries set up by that Constitution. So therefore, some have made the case to say that, well, the true authority in America is the Constitution. So therefore, if those in power are going against that Constitution, then we have no reason to obey it. Yes. Now, I'm not necessarily saying I agree with that point of view or not, but I think that is one way of looking at it. It would be similar in a, quote, religious context. The Bible is the true authority. If you have religious leaders who are supposed to be following that Bible and their congregations are supposed to be set up according to that Bible and they're going against it, Absolutely. are you bound yeah. to obey them? Indeed. Another thing I want to talk to you about a bit later on, where where is scripture in our hierarchy of elements that inform our understanding? And I think it must be at the top. And I'll qualify that later, actually, but uh, we'll come as a surprise or disappointment to some people listening that scripture at the top shouldn't reason be at the top. One thing I would say about there is that the decision to allow scripture in one's own understanding to be at the top is based upon having already come to a position of belief. And therefore you're saying, I believe in Christ and therefore I believe that the scriptures are telling true things about reality. So the, the reason is actually involved in that. But nevertheless, when it comes to, you know, the, the everyday existence, we're saying, you know, scripture is, is my guide and I've made a rational choice to accept that position. But I want to talk a bit more about that later because I think it's a very, very interesting aspect to this. Um, one thing I want to say before we move on to the next section is that I did mention about the conversation with Dr. Martin Erdman, which I do encourage people to go back and listen to and he really did stress that there is a tension between true christian faith and the state in all situations not just in the modern context but throughout the ages and that's actually right there should be a tension and we have not we've not allowed that tension to have its the life that it should have so i think if anything comes from this conversation that should be one of them that we should live with that understanding that we we should expect the state to be antagonistic towards us if we are believers. We should not be surprised by that. And we must live in that state of tension, preferably, of course, in relationship to God. Um, so I want to move on to this next area, which is um, psychology. I mean, one of the trends in recent years has been to sort of encourage psychological, in quotes here, explanations for why people believe in so-called conspiracy theories. This is not just talking about people of faith. This is anybody. Um, I note that academics uh, and their media mouthpieces, however, hardly ever say that the reason why people believe in conspiracy theories is that they're actually they're actually onto something. They've got some reason to, to think there might be uh, a conspiracy going on. What they normally say is, oh, well, people have deep psychological needs. They want to find um, some sort of sense in a complicated world. So they are attracted to conspiracy theories because these theories offer simple black and white answers to very complex questions, things like that. Now, I'm going to say straight away that I think there may be some truth in those kinds of analyses in a very broad way, or in fact, there may be some individuals who do conform precisely to that kind of thing. But nevertheless, my feeling about this is that it's rather generally a weak argument, largely because it excludes the possibility that you could actually be onto something real. There's a real problem with an explanation. You are really questioning it, and you find, therefore, that you are forced, just as a thinking human being, to hypothesize that there is some other explanation than one you're being told. So my feeling about it is that just on that level, I'm suspicious about these over-psychological explanations. Now, Mike, I presume you have come across these sorts of things in articles and what people have said what was your general reaction to these attempts to sort of explain everything away by reducing it to psychology well at a personal level i find it very insulting mm. as you say you have facts you have data what it speaks more to is your motivations in looking at those facts and data and coming to a conclusion. And then it does, it doesn't address the facts and the data. Yes, ever. Hardly and ever. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's very insulting 
to chalk everything up to that. And I do believe, as you alluded to, that we as human beings, there are sort of emotional and, quote, psychological motivations behind things. But again, we're talking about motivations. That's entirely separate from what happens outside of me as an individual. You know, yes. it's as they say, how we view reality, you know, how our brains process the light that re- we receive into our eyes and all those things. And, you know, there, there's this talk about, well, what we actually see and process in our brains may or may not be exactly what we're see- what's actually outside in reality. But what's outside in reality remains the same, regardless of our perspective. Absolutely. That's a, that's a very good illustration there. I think a good example of it, too, and again, I'm not stating an opinion on it either way, but there's this idea in psychology about the human mind's need to see shapes and definitions and things. So they say when people discuss, uh, for example, the so-called face on Mars, Cydonia, and all that, they will say, oh, well, see, people see a face there because we're oh, hardwired right. to want to find shape and definition <laughs> in things. I mean, to me, regardless yes. of whether there's any substantive reality to there being a face on Mars, I find that kind of ridiculous and dishonest to just chalk it up to that. I mean, you're not dealing with what's actually there. You're not doing higher level research or sending out, you know, more advanced probes to scan the area or any of those different things. Yes. You're just merely dismissing it based upon psychology. Yeah, good point. I, I'm very skeptical of that. However, I take your point because if there was, in fact, a face there that was intelligently designed by somebody, it would be, in inverted commas, explained about, away by this very lazy explanation that you've, you've just mentioned. So I think you're absolutely right, yeah. Yeah, it's sort of as if, as if saying, oh, you know what? You never mind that. We're not going to bother with that. <laughs> it's just all in your head anyways. So you just go on and... Continue to uh, drink the Kool Aid and <laughs> watch the news, and we'll tell yes. you what to think. Yes, you know, there's a place for looking for some of these core, you know, human emotional motivations and things. I mean, I, I'm the first one to do it about some things, but you don't use that as your sole argument against yes. anything yes and we must be self-critical mustn't we we do in fact all have psychological tendencies in various ways we all have various needs and we need to be aware of that self-critical critical realists about our grasp of reality i think that's absolutely fine uh, of course a lot of people i think are not self-critical in that way and there is a tendency to think that if you just apply logic and reason you're going to get there without realizing that we do actually bring an awful lot of baggage with us but i'm not going so far as the post you know the radical postmodernist to say therefore we can't understand anything because we're just a we're just walking baggage i don't mean that we need to be aware of these things um I, looking at the various bits of these sort of psychological literature um, now and again, I mean, I've picked up on quite a few what I consider to be logical fallacies, actually. I mean, things like, oh, you know, people believe in conspiracy theories because they're suspicious of authority. And, okay, yeah, if you're suspicious of authority, then maybe you are more likely to believe in a conspiracy theory that points to authority as having done something wrong. But then if you have been lied to time and time again, then it's rational, isn't it, to be suspicious of the authorities that may be lying to you again. Yeah, it's sort of a straw man argument, isn't it? I think our default position as human beings should be to be suspicious of authority. I mean, that's sort of a safety mechanism, right? It, it, to be suspicious does not mean you do not give trust yes. at some point. But our default starting position is to say, look, you want to be an authority over me. Okay, well, I'm going to be suspicious of your motivations and your goals until you demonstrate it to me otherwise. Yes. That's what we so, do in the rest of life, isn't it? When we form yes. friendships, we don't just say, hey, I'm best friends with you like a small child will do. And of course, as we know, small children can end up in very dangerous situations very easily precisely because of that lack of reserve. So, yeah, of course, we should do that individually makes sense you learn to trust each other and we should do it with government as well we should do it with all authority i think that's absolutely right yeah yeah i mean and not to go not to go contrary <laughs> to what we were just saying but from a psychological point of view it's healthy i mean we have this sort of base desire as human beings when we have people at these high level positions of authority over us 
we want to believe that they've somehow been vetted and gone through this process and we could totally trust what they (laughs) say and who they are and what they do and all these different things. And psychologically speaking, it becomes uncomfortable for us to question them because now we're questioning everything. Because if we could question whether we could trust that president or senator or whoever, then that means the entire system's questionable and we can't by necessity trust any of them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, so, yes, yes. And that, that brings us to the whole business about worldview. Um, obviously, different levels of worldview, a very complex thing to talk about. But yeah, that that realization that maybe you cannot trust the whole system is a really painful thing to experience, which is what so many people describe as going down the rabbit hole, isn't it? Yes. I mean, I think, it's, man, that's a good point. I think at its core, really what we're talking about is the system. And yes. whether you can trust the system or not, that's what becomes very uncomfortable for people. People want to believe we have this well-refined, regulated, modern, advanced system that we've risen above mm-hmm. our paltry habits and evils as human beings and that society is so much more advanced than it was 2,000 years ago or however many years ago. Mm-hmm. And that we can rest assured that things are going to be okay because the system has checks and balances and everything will work out. You don't worry, just go back to work. <laughs> and I think at its core, that's really what it is. It's not about the individual politicians or anything else. It's really at its core, it's the system. And people do not want to question those individuals because that means questioning the system. It's a mythology. Well, it's an idolatry of the state, isn't it? Yes. It is this mythology that it is good, it is functioning well, and of course it will self-propagandize in order to keep that idea afloat, but it is idolatrous, and I think another that's another thing that should warn us as Christians. We're not placing our faith in the state. We should hold the state to account as we do individuals. Yes, and I mean... As we, as we do ourselves. I think the same issue pops up in the church. We mm-hmm. trust in this church system, whether it's denominational or whatever. We trust that, oh, this system that we have in place is going to keep false teachers and corrupt leaders out of yes, position. Absolutely. And therefore, you know, you can't question those leaders because they've gone through the system. <laughs> it's absolutely true. You know, I was contrasting my experience to yours earlier on. Well, now I'm going to totally agree with you because I went through, as many people will know, half of a theological, you know, sort of ministerial training thing, the beginning of that. And while I was there, I asked the head of the Baptist College, it was an ecumenical thing, I asked him, did he believe the resurrection actually happened? And he said he wasn't prepared to say whether it was an historical reality or not. And I thought, this guy is the head of the Baptist College, and he's not prepared to affirm one of the central tenets of Christianity. I mean, I can understand somebody in the general public saying that, but somebody who actually claims to be one of the leaders in the church, he's made that position, and yet he's gone through a system of selection that has allowed him to be there, and he doesn't even believe one of the main things about Christianity. I thought, that was really quite an eye-opener. I, mean, I knew that sort of thing went on, but to, to actually experience it with somebody high up like that in the hierarchy was, was a bit of a shock, really. Yeah, that would be. Absolutely. <laughs> you would not expect somebody up near the top of the hierarchy to say, well, I'm not committed to an answer on uh, whether Christ rose from the dead or not. You know, never mind that our entire faith depends upon it. No, that's right. And I'm not trying to have a go at him. But uh, yes, it does just show us that these systems are not perfect. And we need to continually hold them to account in every age, and in every place. But then on the other side of the coin, there is this trend these days to say that all authority is therefore bad. Everything is a lie. We can't trust anything. And I've said this many times on the show. And therefore, authority is a bad thing. We must reject it in every case. Obviously, as a Christian, I can't believe that because I believe there's such a thing as good tradition, good authority. We have lines of teaching that have come down through the ages and they therefore form a tradition and they have an authority because of that. So I You know, that can be argued for. So I can't believe that all authority in itself is bad. And I also think just generally, I don't see how we can live our lives if we are rejecting all authority at every point. I think there must come a point at which we assent in terms of our will and our reason to accepting some level of authority. And I know there are going to be people listening who who are going to reject and, and, and be disappointed by what I've said there. But I think, practically speaking, I don't see how we can live our lives if we reject every single piece of authority in our lives. I mean, even within families, 
I, I do expect my children to accept my authority as their father. I try not to abuse that authority, of course. But the idea that they could at every moment just challenge me simply because I am their father, that strikes me as something that would chime with a kind of Marxist revolutionary position, which you know, I, I very much reject. I agree, and I think the father analogy is a good one. So if you're a father and you love your children and you're operating according to the standards, let's say, of the Bible – you know, you're showing love and you're showing compassion with that child. You're also showing strength and you're, you're keeping them safe within the boundaries as prescribed by the Bible. This is how the household should be ran and this is how it shouldn't be ran. Now, if that father starts abusing his children, then guess what? Now he's operating outside the bounds of biblical authority and therefore the children are right in, you know, rejecting yes. that authority of their father. When he's broken that, well, let's just say that covenant between them and, and the authority he's under, which should be God. Hmm. So I think that when we talk about authority from a Christian point of view, a lot of times we tend to have a very fundamental lack of understanding and even what that word should mean for us. Because in my view, an authority, biblically speaking, would be more like an administrator of what the real authority is, which is the Bible, someone who facilitates the use of that Bible, its application to our lives. I need to go one further step than that. Of course, we talk about the Bible as being the word of God, which would be a whole discussion in itself. But ultimately, we're saying God is the authority and the Bible is the main means in which he has communicated the important things he wishes us to understand. Yeah. So it's it's not actually the Bible that is the authority. It's God himself, isn't it? Yes, I appreciate that. Because that was sure. Nice. sure. No, I'm just, just, you know, I know you know that, but I just <laughs> yes. thought it worth saying. Yeah. Yeah. It would be like saying if he was vocally speaking, well, the, the sounds aren't the authority, it's the mouth it's coming from. Yeah. But the, the human beings who are in what we call authority positions, they're really just workers. They're diplomats. They're people who are basically taking and following orders and carrying them out. That's what it should be. So therefore, for us to say, well, I question all authority and I reject all authority, it's really sort of a flawed way of thinking because what you should be saying as a Christian is, okay, my sole authority is God. And everyone else in between are merely employees of his, for lack of better term. And well, indeed, you said diplomats. Paul calls us ambassadors, actually. So you're absolutely spot on. Yes. So really, as long as those people are operating within the confines as defined by the Bible and our sole authority, God, then everything should be fine. That's really the question there. But I think yes. that I, I probably went down a bit of a rabbit trail or probably did not say exactly what I was trying to say quite so well. No, I know, I know exactly what you mean. So, yes. I mean, the person in authority in a certain aspect of life, because we all have different spheres of authority, but the person in authority in this particular aspect of life and ourselves who don't have that level of authority in that particular aspect of life, we're both looking at the same rule book, as it were, and we're holding each other to account. So although somebody has this authority over us, at every point we're saying, look, just a minute, are you measuring up to what it says in the rule book? Because the rule book has been written by the one who created us both. I think that's that's key to what you were saying there. Um, yes, I mean, I think that's – okay, so that's our authority. We're, we're, okay, we're all following yes. this set of instructions, whether – whether you have a higher pay grade than me, right, we're all yes. following the same instructions. And if somebody breaks away from those instructions, then it's like, well, wait, okay, wait a minute. I'm not going to listen to him so much. I'm just going to listen to these instructions. And hopefully maybe he'll find his way back to following the same instructions. And I, maybe I can even help him. Hey, wait a minute. You, you're a bit off the page here. Here's, here's where Absolutely. What you need to read. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and I think us as Christians, I, here was a thought I had that I, I didn't really get to. I think that way of thinking that we need to reject all authority and we need to question everything. Um, on one hand, it leads to, and this may sound unrelated, but it leads to these conversations and beliefs about things like, for example, the Mandela effect. It's where people start coming up with these fantasies that there were time travelers who went back in time and changed the Bible. So therefore now what's that, right? And I mean, yeah. there are Christians yeah. who are having conversations about that, which seems unbelievable to me Yes, because now you no longer have anything 
Yeah. You, you've removed the measuring stick. Absolutely. Um, if you are the center of your epistemological world, as it were, then yeah, you you are God, aren't you? It's solipsism, really. Uh, this leads me precisely onto the, the next thing that I wanted to discuss. Actually, was this whole issue of the crazy line, which I mentioned uh, when we we had a pre-interview discussion about this. Um, I don't think what it was. It was James Corbett, uh, James Evan Pilato, and I think Tom Secker a few years ago were having a discussion about conspiracy theories and what it was rational to believe. And what it was not rational to believe. And I think it was part of the Corbett Report's Beard World Order series, because they all had beards at the time, which I thought was an excellent title for this. Anyway, they came up with this idea of the crazy line, and they were they basically reached the conclusion that it was going to be different for everybody, of course. We, we consider it to be rational to believe so far, and then there comes a line after which we individually believe that it's not rational to believe X, Y, and Z. And I think that's a great term for it. Where is our crazy line? Where is mine? Where is yours. So the question then is, how do we define where that crazy line is? Well, what people usually do is appeal to critical thinking, which obviously is you know, it's absolutely the right thing to do. We should indeed be critical thinkers. But I often think that people tend to work with a, a rather narrow view of what critical thinking is. It's usually limited to empirical evidence and logic and reason, and all of which are, of course, important and in, in vital, in fact. But there's rarely any recognition, I find, of the importance of worldviews. And I do think that that is mistaken, because I think worldviews are very powerful. We all have them. And in fact, it's part of our health as rational individuals to have a worldview, even if we're not aware that we've got them. We all have assumptions about reality. We do not sit on a epistemological one meter square of flying carpet in the, in the midst of a, a completely incomprehensible universe. We, all sorts of things we take for granted. And I think from the point of view, we're speaking here about people of faith and specifically Christians, we have a worldview that is well-defined and quite broad in its scope. It informs us about a lot of things about reality. A lot of people would criticize that and say, therefore, you're blinkered. There are aspects of reality you can't understand because of that worldview. I would turn that on its head and say that actually, I think having a Christian worldview is a healthy thing, obviously, because I believe Christianity to be true. And that actually that operates as a really helpful filter when it comes to an awful lot of nonsense that is out there. Now, there's a whole massive conversation we could have about this. I just mentioned the business about that crazy line, and I just think part of defining the crazy line is to take seriously and to examine the worldviews that we have and realize how powerful they are and not treat them always as a negative thing. Yeah, absolutely. In recent years, I've, I've kind of really... Um become a lot more aware of my worldview and and how that forms the basis for my understanding it's the lenses i look at the world through mm. i mean like you said everyone has one whether you know it or not you have a worldview our society by and large popular thought has one worldview and and uh say us as christians have another and one of the things we see in society as a whole, the worldview has kind of – it's really filtered and defined by sort of that post-enlightenment thinking. Mm. As we were talking about earlier, uh, there is no absolute truth. Question everything. Everything is nebulous. There is no framework for what you believe in. Mm. I mean – you could say, and it's not something I really debate about in the same sense, but you could say that foundationally that worldview has the idea of, well, there was the Big Bang and we can't explain it. And then there was everything, right? <laughs> right. I mean, and as a Christian, I mean, I could actually take a Big Bang hmm. idea and incorporate it into my worldview. I mean, it absolutely that, it's possible to do quite clearly. Yes. So that, yes. I mean, that, that's a whole nother thing. I don't. I don't think that's a binary decision there. It's either sure. Big Bang or creation. <laughs> no. But, but I think that um, with modern, a lot of mo popular modern thinking, that we start coming up with multiverse theory and all these other different things to try to form some kind of worldview to explain everything around us. But then in the end, what mm. it basically comes up with is absolute uncertainty because your yes. worldview is is nebulous. Yes, and the taking exception to absolute truths, which is extremely common, is a big factor in people's, many people's worldview. That's one of those things that I think is often rather 
hidden from people's consciousnesses. Another thing that would be rather more easy to point out would be that there is this prejudice against the supernatural with many people who claim to be rational in their their thinking. Those who uh, employ critical thinking would not be critical with regard to their belief that all supernatural occurrences are false. Supernatural explanations are false. I think a lot of people would would not be self-critical in that respect and yet claim to be great critical thinkers. Um, So that is an aspect of worldview that is not allowing them even to think about such an issue. Um, I have an example here of something that I find quite helpful to illustrate this. People may remember that I've talked about the flat earther, Mark Sargent, who has this very fanciful story about designers of the flat earth and dome, as he claims it is. Um, Well, he doesn't actually claim it is. He, He talks as if it is through his illustrations. They fashioned the cosmos to be the kind of cosmos that if you look at it, you investigate it, you come up with the conclusion that the earth is a globe because they've designed it in that way to be lying. And that strikes me as a more Gnostic view of reality than a Christian view, because of course, in the Christian doctrine of creation, you have God, um, who is good and loving, has created a good cosmos, even though it's a fallen cosmos. Uh, It's not going to be lying to you fundamentally. He's created, you know, humans in the image of God so we can think, we can investigate. Uh, And so I would say that a Christian ought not to believe what Mark Sargent argues. But that's because the Christian worldview trumps his argument. Now, that can sound like it's being unthinking, but I don't mean it that way. What I mean is, at that point, it becomes a competition between the specific claims that Mark Sargent is making and the truth of Christianity as a worldview. You know, which is more certain for me, what Mark Sargent says or the claims of Christianity? So I'm not saying the claims of Christianity are unfalsifiable. I think they're actually falsifiable, um, <laughs> which is another thing that needs explaining. That in principle, it, you could falsify Christianity were it false. I think that's right. So you see what I mean? It becomes a kind of balance between those two things, the particular claims that are being made and the strength of the worldview that you hold, which itself may be subject and indeed ideally should be subject to counter argument. But until you get counter arguments that really overturn the worldview that you hold, you're perfectly rational to use that worldview as a filter to filter out nonsense that is coming your way. So I would say, based upon a worldview argument there, no Christian ought to believe what Mark Sargent says. So that's just one aspect of a worldview, I think, working healthily to help us in our interpretation of the world. And there are all sorts of examples I could bring up, and I won't go into detail unless it comes up again, but um, I've got one about reincarnation and the evidence for that, which which works in a similar kind of way. Have you, Mike, in your own experience, been aware of that sort of filtration process going on in your thinking, where you, the Christian worldview has such an obvious truth to it that is not falsified in your experience that allows you to filter out nonsense so that you don't have to spend hours and hours and hours going through the evidence for something which just is obviously false. Yes, absolutely. Um, And going back to your illustration, the reason we know that and we disagree with that and feel as if we can confidently say it's false is that God is a God of truth in his creation He created to convey his truth. So if you're claiming that our creation is at its core deceptive, I mean, that totally flies in the face of what we know about God. So therefore, it can be easily eliminated as an explanation for reality. Absolutely. And so so what Mark Sargent would have to do is to provide another argument that actually disproves the nature of God or something like that. Yes. To go back to answering your question, my example is when we have the conversation discussion about alien life on other planets. Contrary to what some Christians might think, in and of itself, the notion of there being life created by God on other planets does not conflict with God or the Bible, in my opinion. Mm, I agree. The notion of aliens visiting here necessarily does not conflict with God. Absolutely. However, if you have an alien come to planet Earth and say, oh, we actually are what you thought was God, and we wrote the Bible, and one of us was Jesus, that conflicts with the Bible. Yes. 
and historical scholarship. But yeah, both go hand yeah. in hand. Sure. When you get some of these accounts of abductees and things like that, who say, "Oh yes, these aliens, they uh, took me aboard their craft and they told me how they came here two thousand years ago and they showed me a video of one of them being crucified and it was actually Jesus Christ, but he was an <laughs> alien." Um, yes. Then you can easily right there say, okay, I as a Christian cannot agree with that. I do not agree with that because it conflicts with my worldview. And you are right to do that. And I think this is what a lot of people tend to understand, that actually in terms of logic, that is a perfectly logical and responsible thing to do. You have a strong belief. You're rationally justified in that belief. But therefore, you're completely within your rights in terms of epistemology to reject the weaker claim that is being made. And it would, that weaker claim would have to have a, a strong argument attached to it that attacked your metaphysical beliefs in order to have a chance of getting anywhere. I think we're completely justified in using worldviews in that way. Yes. And I would say in contrast to that, one of the mistakes I see Christians make, let's just go back to that that example again is then then they will say therefore there cannot be any aliens anywhere else in the universe right. and that yeah. does not make rational sense and no. then to the non-believer it makes their argument against the supposed account of alien visitors being the orchestrators of our biblical faith to the unbeliever that then destroys their argument against that mm. you get where i'm going with that Absolutely. We need to be really careful what claims we're actually making. And as you said, something like that, that there may be life on other planets and that we may have been visited, irrespective of whether there's evidence for that or not, is not something that contradicts, as far as I understand, the scriptures. So therefore, there is no worldview prohibition against that in principle, even though I personally don't believe that we've been visited. That's another matter. That's that's not something. No, that, I don't. Yeah, I don't, I don't form <laughs> that based upon a worldview consideration. I form that just based on the fact that to date I have not encountered evidence that convinces me of that and various aspects of it that seem in principle implausible to me, um, which I don't want to go into because that's not what we're talking about really today. But yeah, I, I agree basically with what you're saying. Yeah, I, I don't uh, believe they've visited either, and that's through just my own quote, rational, logical thinking. Yeah, but if they had, it wouldn't be a problem. And I, and I agree with you. I will actually mention this thing about reincarnation because I think it's it's quite a good one, actually. Um, just see where we go with it. I don't know if they're included or not. Um, I mean, I've heard people claim that there is empirical evidence for past lives, that people in certain regression sessions report details that they ought not to know. You know, if they hadn't lived before, they shouldn't know such and such. And so that's taken as evidence, empirical evidence, for reincarnation. So that, of course, would contradict the Abrahamic faith's teaching on death and judgment and the afterlife, which typically says you, you live and then you're judged and then there's some form of afterlife, whatever that might be. Um, so the claim then can be made, well, Christians or people of other faith, Abrahamic faiths, that they really ought to bow to this evidence, be open-minded to accept that their view of the afterlife is wrong, because the empirical evidence tells us that's the case. Well, again, I think this is an example of ignoring the role of worldview, because one of the components of the Christian worldview, at least, is that the existence of demons, or spiritual beings against God, and also against those people who trust in God, that these demons exist, and therefore it is plausible that they may actually be behind such dramatic evidences, in inverted commas, giving people data that they would not otherwise know, precisely for the purpose of distracting people away from God. Um, so it turns out that the empirical evidence, and I'm not discounting that it may well be empirical evidence, is not quite so clear as it seems at first glance. Um, for the non-Christian, no doubt this will seem an unlikely way of explaining this away, or even an impossible way of going about this. But for the Christian, I think it will seem like the likely explanation, because to us it is more certain that the Christian teaching on the afterlife is true, because of Christ's teaching and the apostles' teaching, than that the reincarnationist's interpretation of the evidence uh, is true. We're balancing those two things again. So the worldview is controlling our understanding of the data, but it's not a control that is stopping critical thinking, because hopefully we have arrived at our Christian faith based upon reason. Reason and our faith are hand in hand. 
I don't know whether I'll leave that in. I don't know whether you've got anything to say on that, Mike. If you haven't, I'll just move on. Do you have anything else to add on that? Well, I did have a thought arise in that. Hmm. When we say empirical evidence, we mean something that's measurable, that's inarguable, that is demonstrably true, correct? Um, well, kind of. I, that's what it's aiming for, yeah. Well, yeah, that's the ideal. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So if we were to say with reincarnation, you have two people, person A, who is the experiencer, the one who they claim would be applied that they're reincarnated from a past life, right? Mm. And then you have the other subject, B, who is the researcher, the psychologist, uses hypnosis or whatever method they use to bring out this experience, right? Mm. So the claim would be that person B got information from person A that they couldn't have known other than if they had been that person, right? That's it, yeah. So as person B, what is your metric for gauging whether that information is accurate? Well, it would either be a written historical account or what else? I mean, you're a time traveler. You have a video <laughs> recording. I mean, how do you know that that person – historical figure let's just for making the conversation simple say i don't know cleopatra how do you know that that experience was uniquely experienced by that person well the only metric you could have reliably would be some sort of written account right so you're saying that person a never could have possibly ever read or heard that written sure. account you know that for absolute certainty. I take your point. I know I completely take your point. And I have not looked into this kind of research. And there may be all sorts of methodological flaws, as you are indicating there. And I think one needs to be very aware of that. However, off the top of my mind, I could think of something that in principle could be discovered. Well, let's say you have a small child. They couldn't possibly have, have read ancient literature. They perhaps can't even read or something. They go into this regressive state and they give information. Well, I suppose you could say relatives have told them whatever. They, they have a limited vocabulary. We could say that as well. And yet they come out with a surprising vocabulary, surprising information. I'm not saying that's ever happened, but I'm saying even if one could have an example like that, that a researcher interested in this field might then say, ah, that's evidence of reincarnation. You ought to abandon your Christian beliefs. Even then, I'm saying the worldview is strong enough to at least challenge that position just based on the worldview, which is not to say that the Christian worldview itself is immune from criticism. If you want to bring an argument against it, as Paul says, you know, if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, then we'd be more to be pitied than, than everybody else. You know, let's bring an, an argument against the Christian faith and let's have that kind of argument. And if it's shown at the end of the day that Christian faith is not true, that worldview collapses then that filter no longer exists. But you have to have that argument in order to remove that worldview. And until that happens, that filter is perfectly rational to be used. So I wasn't going against your example, your criticism of the, of the methodology, which may well be justified. They may well have weak methodologies, but I just don't know that. And I was picking the ideal case where perhaps it was shown that something really odd is going on with this research. Yes, and... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Um, I think at the end of the day, what you're essentially come down to is a battle of worldviews. Mm -hmm. Because in that example, if you have the worldview of a Christian, you would say, oh, well, see, it's demons feeding this information. In a sort of a new age worldview, you might say, uh -huh. oh, well, it's the Akashic uh, records, this, this dimension, this, <laughs> yes. this information is coming through to this person, right? If you um, are somebody who is like prone to belief in like, say, aliens and them communicating with humans, you might say, oh, see, it was aliens mm -hmm. who communicated it, right? At the end of the day, what we're talking about is worldviews and which worldview makes more sense. Fascinating. And that's precisely what is omitted from most of these conversations about critical thinking. So I'm so glad we've had this conversation because I think for particularly, well, for everybody actually, but particularly for people who consciously hold to a worldview, it's very important for us to realize the health of that, but also to continue in our lives to hold that worldview to rational inquiry. I'm not letting our worldviews off the hook, but it's that's an issue in its own right. You don't just let go of your worldview because there's just some weak challenge that comes along. It needs to be considered in its own right. Um, I wanted to move on to an issue where I think 
those who criticize, uh, those of us who are interested in matters that might be called conspiracy theory, um, I think they're right in some respects. And one way in which they're right is to be concerned on a pastoral level. I've heard and read many things by people who say that, you know, there are individuals who really ought not to be into researching these kinds of things. If they become obsessive, it can ruin their lives. It can feed a sense of pride. You know, that people can think, well, I've, I'm in possession of secret knowledge that other people are not around me. And of course, that can cause problems. Um, you know, it can make up for lack of self-esteem. It can self-justify social isolation. All sorts of negative things that can come from this. But what I reject about this is the idea that, therefore, that means that nobody ought to be involved in thinking about these things at all if they are a Christian, just because there may be pastoral issues in some cases. Because I can think of people who have become obsessive about football, and it's consumed their life, which I consider to be, you know, an unhelpful thing. People who, you know, can play computer games far too long, people who spend far too long on their social media devices, all these things which may be neutral, uh, in fact, may be even good if, if, if used properly, can become obsessive, can become problematic. So I, I, I find this sort of thing unacceptable as a blanket argument. However, surely it does apply in many cases. Maybe there are cases where it's the right thing as a Christian brother or sister or a Christian leader to advise somebody, we'll just lay off. Have a period of six months where you don't look at this stuff anymore or... Perhaps it's best that you use your talents in another way because it's deleterious to that person. What do you think about this? Do you think that there is a major issue here that really does need to be taken seriously? Uh, yeah, I do. As with all things, we need balance. Hmm. It, it could be food. I eat when I get hungry because I need sustenance. Hmm. But if I go out just seeking food for the sake of food – then I become fat, I become lazy, I become unhealthy. Hmm. So I think it could be the same with this sort of thing, with research and with conspiracies yeah. and all those things. If you're looking at reality and as you say, well, that doesn't seem right to me. I'm kind of offended that that was even offered to me as an explanation. And then that gives you the desire to look for an explanation that, let's say, falls in line with a conspiracy, then that's healthy and normal. But if you begin just obsessively, I've got to find a conspiracy and it becomes this full time thing, mm. then that's quite unhealthy. I mean, I myself, I would say for the past year, I've kind of stepped back from a lot of that. Right. Because I myself, I felt like, what reason have I got in this? I mean, I, I have my worldview. I feel like I understand the things that are happening in reality to a decent degree and I have a decent explanation and a, a sort of a decent framework to sort of understand the things that are happening around me. Do I need to dig deeper? Do I need to be aware of every bit of minutia? Yes. As a Christian, I don't feel like I do. I think that at the end of the day, I know fundamentally the big points that I need to know. And I have what's transpired in our world that I know about filtered through that. Do I need to prove the point anymore to myself or to others? I mean, you get a sort of fundamental foundational understanding of things and it becomes sort of a natural um, mechanism that you begin to, when a, an event happens, you sort of have a pretty good grasp right away. Of, yes this seems to be pointing to what seems to really happen absolutely you you start to form a lower level worldview <laughs> so in fact that could be quite instructive because you could imagine some counter argument from an official source poking holes in whatever it is you're thinking about what's going on in the news etc but you actually through weeks and weeks and months and months and years and years of looking at this kind of thing, you have developed a certain worldview based upon your reasonable research. You're not going to be overturned by that just that one piece of propaganda that comes your way. So, in fact, we are constantly in the business of building different levels of worldview. They operate all the time. It's extremely important for us. Yes. And there was another time in my life where I, I came to – question my motivations in communicating to others. Hmm. And I actually, I felt like it was one of those moments where God 
sort of guided me in this. And that is when I have this theory or idea or belief, and I feel led to share it with others or get involved in a conversation or argument even with others. What are my motivations in that? Yes. Well, as a Christian, it should be because I want to convey Mm. the truth to this person. And if they're not a believer in hopes of having their eyes opened and come to a saving faith. Mm. Otherwise, I probably should not be involved in that argument or debate. I mean, because then if it's not motivated by that sort of simple thing of conveying faith and the reasons for it, then I am merely probably acting out of pride. It has become a distraction, hasn't it, at that point, distracting you away from what you should be doing with your life. And of course, more generally, just living as a husband or a wife or a father or mother or whatever it is, if it gets to the point where you're neglecting those healthy, normal things that God is calling us all to do and be in our various ways, then it has become a distortion. I mean, I agree with you. We should be sharing the gospel. We should be sharing the the, the love of God with people. Obviously, if what we're talking about gets in the way of that, that's clearly a distortion. But even on a more mundane level, it can be a very dangerous thing and distort us away from our normal functioning as human beings. I think there is, there really is a pastoral issue that does need to be taken seriously. But I think we both agree, it cannot be used as a blanket ban. That doesn't make any sense to me. No, it doesn't, because... Again, you're going back to that thing we began talking about. Mm. Is it fair to say to somebody you shouldn't question anything? Yeah. You shouldn't use the rational faculties that God has actually given you. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. I mean, one last thing. I'm sure I've missed out lots of things, but things that have stuck in my mind from reading things. One last thing that I want to mention is that it said that people don't theorize about conspiracies in the Bible. Uh, And so the model is that we... We shouldn't be bothered about that either. Do we find Jesus theorizing about conspiracies? What do you make of that one, Mike? Well, <laughs> I think it's a bit <laughs> odd. You know, I, wow. Um, I'm very hesitant to be specific here because I would need to look. But I would say that that's actually yes. patently false, that there are discussions of conspiracies in the Bible. Yes. Uh, and now, there is there is a verse that I'm familiar with, and again, I don't remember specifically which one it is, I want to say it's in Daniel, where there is a statement made about not looking for conspiracies. But that statement is made in a certain context, and it was when Daniel was in Babylon, essentially he had a role to play there, that through divine providence he was led into, and he was not to get caught up in looking for conspiracies amongst those in power in Babylon. He needed to just do what God was guiding him to do. Absolutely. There's so often things like this in the Bible, which once you understand the context, it doesn't have necessarily a broad application. And, and there can be a, a misapplication sometimes to think it does. Yeah. Yeah. And I, mean, I mean, that's an old soapbox for me. Context is king. <laughs> yes, I need to read it in context. There is no other book on planet Earth that you don't read in context generally. You don't just go into Moby Dick and pick a sentence randomly out of there and make an entire statement on the book. Mm-hmm. Based on that one sentence. Yes, and yet we're encouraged to do that very often, aren't we? By, you know, open up the Bible and, and something will pop out to you and that's what you've got to think about today. Well, really? <laughs> Not necessarily. I will almost certainly take that out of context if I follow that every day. Yeah, I mean, well, hey, why don't you go take um, the verse about the talking donkey and Balaam <laughs> and it develop theology based on that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure some people have, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me at all. <laughs> it's called Shrek. <laughs> No, I didn't actually. I didn't mean it facetiously. I bet somebody has somewhere. I'm sorry. I bet they have. (laughs) They probably have. It's a point in history, at least. (laughs) Well, I think that occurred to me is that you know when you read the New Testament, the writers of the New Testament are reporting on conspiracy. They're often saying, "And the authorities conspired and plotted against Jesus." And in fact, we have the Passion narratives which shot through with conspiracy. Religious leaders at the time, local Roman authorities, however much they hated each other, etc., were nevertheless conspiring in their own ways to get rid of Jesus. So the gospel writers report this. 
So they're talking about conspiracies here in this respect. So I don't see this makes any sense at all, really. Well, no. And then, you know, I would posit a um, bit of a, um, a hypothetical argument to you. Mm. If you use that example, you're going to get countered with, well, see, since there was a conspiracy against Jesus to crucify him, he didn't oppose it. So therefore, you shouldn't either. I, I could very easily see people saying that sort of thing. And I'm sure they have. And what I would say to that, as well as the rest of the New Testament, because I actually was involved in a discussion about this recently concerning the uh, right to bear arms, self-defense and all that sort of thing. And the counter to that idea was, well, see, the disciples, the apostles, they didn't uh, fight against Rome when uh, when they were persecuted, when they were uh, crucified themselves, some of them. And there, are, there seem to be prohibitions in the New Testament against doing that. So then they will say, well, see, and this is sort of the extreme argument in this conversation. Mm-hmm. The statement was essentially made, therefore, you as a Christian, if, for example, you have a home invasion and someone comes against you and your family, you shouldn't defend them. Or if you're, say, in a bank that's getting robbed and you have the means to protect the others in that bank, you shouldn't do anything because that goes against the gospel. Right. And that okay. sounds insane to me anyways. And, it, and again, not to go back to the soapbox, but context. Hmm. Yeshua, Jesus, when he was crucified, the reason he didn't oppose it was it was part of his plan, right? To die for yes. sins. The gospel was the mandate for the apostles to deliver, you know, the mandate was for them to deliver the gospel, to share the truth with the rest of the world. Hmm. Therefore, if when they were being oppressed and persecuted and crucified, if they opposed that, it would negate the delivery of that gospel because they would essentially be saying my life in the context of you persecuting me for because of the gospel, my life is more important than that gospel. Therefore, I'm going to defend it. So just going back to the modern situation, if you as a believer and you're out in the world and you say are evangelizing and you have someone come against you because of the sake of you evangelizing, and if you have witnesses around, maybe then you, and I'm not even saying for absolute certainty here, but maybe then you shouldn't take action to defend yourself physically. Hmm. But let's counter that with if you as a Christian, you're just living your everyday life and you're out with your family and a person with evil intent come against your family, you weren't in any way evangelizing at that point. How is it a bad witness against the gospel to defend yourself and your family? I mean, I would say quite the contrary. You would actually be making the gospel look bad if you allowed your family or or even others around you to suffer some awful fate. That's an interesting point. And uh, one of the reasons why I cannot embrace absolute pacifism, I do tend, naturally, I I tend towards that. But at the end of the day, when you come up with thought experiments like that, that tend to be rather extreme, I have to say, yeah, I think it's right at certain points to defend yourself and your loved ones and that it's irresponsible not to do that but i don't think we even in the example that i gave i don't think we actually need to go that far and even accept the counter argument that you brought up because what i was saying about the new testament is that these people were reporting on conspiracies Um, irrespective of whether the early Christians then took those reports as something they should act upon. The fact is they reported about conspiracies. And the advice that's coming from so many people is, you mustn't even think about a conspiracy. You mustn't even begin to understand such a thing. Just shut your mind off to it. And in that case, it seems to me, therefore, we should shut our mind off to the passion narrative because somebody is describing a conspiracy at that point. You see what I mean? Yes. Even the talking about it is something that we should shut our minds off to. So uh, it's it's nonsense, isn't it? It is, and I and I have to apologize for diverging from the topic there. No, you um, make some good points that are that are related. And and well, and I actually had a better point to make out of that. So <laughs> um, more direct, which was they were talking about these conspiracies going on, right? And those conspiracies involved what God foreordained to happen, right? 
Okay, but that will be a whole massive conversation then about what it means. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. in God's foreknowledge, etc., etc., and God is sovereign. Yes. So, yeah, nothing's a surprise to God, etc., etc. Yeah, okay. Yeah. He came to give his life mm. for our sins. Absolutely, right? yeah. So to have acted against those conspiracies would have been to have acted against what he intended to happen. So the writers were reporting on those conspiracies, but they weren't acting against them. And I guess the point this brings me to is that when we talk about these things that are happening in the world and what we believe the explanation for them are, in many cases, we would say conspiracies amongst people, we are not talking about them with the goal of stopping them necessarily. Mm -hmm. Now, in some cases, we may be. If it's something happening in your local community and there's this corruption and maybe something being put into the environment that's causing illness – then, I mean, yeah, I think that we may be obligated to try to do something to stop that. But when we scale it up and talk about the world, I don't think anybody – well, I don't think any rational person who talks about these sorts of things and who believes the Bible expects that in talking about these conspiracies that we are going to stop what is going to happen. I know what you mean, Mike, and I sort of agree and disagree, and I'm going to try to <laughs> explain what I mean. I think it depends upon what kind of level of conspiracy we're talking about. I mean, if we're talking about something like, okay, there's going to be, a, at some point, unspecified point in the future, there's going to be some form of global governance, and an antichrist is going to appear on the scene for a short while. Well, there's nothing we can do about that. We can perhaps do everything we can to put that off as long as possible. We can perhaps do everything we can to mitigate so that when it does happen, it will be less bad than it could otherwise be. Because we don't know how bad it could be. It could be a lot worse if we sit on our backsides and do nothing. Yes. Um, and I think that's something that people don't often realize. You know, we do have free will. We can make a, a difference in the world, even though things are prophesied, because they're not spelt out in absolute detail. However, when it comes to something that isn't a matter of God's prophesied, to us. It's just something that I talk about an awful lot on the show is various false flag things that, that are going on or are suspected to go on. Um, I absolutely do hope that in what I'm doing is contributing to a state of affairs where these things will not be so easy to pull off. I can't stop them happening, but hopefully with responsible alternative media talking about these things, people will become more and more aware that they're going on. And if a sufficient number of people are aware, it's going to be harder and harder to pull it off and make political capital out of it. So I absolutely do think that it's a kind of fighting back. Obviously, it's not with arms, it's with talking, it's a conceptual fighting back. Um, so I think it just depends upon what level of conspiracy you're talking about. Um, it all depends the place that these events have in God's prophetic economy. So again, it behooves us to be aware of the scriptures and to put them in their proper place and realize that there are certain things we can do and certain things we can't do and, and operate properly within that, realizing who we are. You know, we're, we're fallible human beings. There's only so much we can do. But I do think we can do and we ought to do. Oh, I absolutely agree. Um, maybe I wasn't uh, stating my point clearly just as you say, when we're talking about things that fall in line with biblical prophecy, you know, when we talk about them, we're not going to stop them. We might mitigate some things, some aspects somewhat. We might buy ourselves a little time or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we're talking about things that happen on a much smaller scale, then I mean, I believe we're absolutely obligated to try to sound the alarm, sound the warning. It's like, you know, uh, the Bible spe and Ezekiel speaks of the watchman on the wall. You know, sound mm. the alert to try to save some lives. Absolutely. One of the things that really sticks in my mind is Francis Schaeffer talking about that and using that as an example. And, and you know, I'm criticizing the church for not being a responsible watchman so often and, and, and allowing distortions to creep into the church and, of course, into the culture as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And getting back to the point we were on, so those who would say that Oh, you shouldn't question things. You shouldn't talk about conspiracies in the Christian context. I believe that's where we were at. And then you mm. would say, well, in the New Testament, there are mentionings of conspiracies all around. Those people are drawing that, I think, from the point of view or the assumption, oh, you shouldn't talk about them because you're trying to stop biblical prophecy. But that's not at all what we're trying to do, and it shouldn't be no. what we're trying to do. 
they would dismiss the idea, you know, there are things we are talking about because we believe that it might make a difference in this world on a smaller scale that's outside of biblical prophecy. They would just lump it all in as, oh, well, you're trying to stop the events that are going to unfold in Revelation. <laughs> uh, and that will fit with a, a broader sort of theological fatalism that I, obviously, as a as a Wesleyan <laughs> in my theology, I reject. I think that we, you've already said, you know, we have free will. I totally agree with you. I think we have libertarian free will. We can actually make decisions in the world that make a real difference. Now, God knows about those decisions from the beginning. He knows about those decisions, which I know that's that, that of course introduces a whole can of worms as to how you make sense of that. And I think there are ways of making sense of that. And I would point people to the conversation I had with uh, Max Andrews uh, when he talked about uh, Molinism, which is a way of trying to understand the relationship between human freedom and God's sovereignty. Now, one may not go with that, but nevertheless, I'm saying there are theological discussions about that kind of thing that can help us to make sense of that. Um, so I very much believe we have free will. We can make real decisions in this world that make a difference even though God knows what's going to happen, and that although things are prophesied and therefore are set in stone, not every detail is set in stone, and there's flexibility within that. And I think it's rational, therefore, for us to think that we can behave in such a way to make a difference within those parameters. We should do. We're obligated to do so. Well, you know, we do tend to paint our own theological and eschatolog <laughs> eschatological <laughs> pictures, right? I mean, yeah. we act as if we know every little detail that every little detail in Revelation is laid out. And for the most part, it really is not. It is dealing mm. with things on a very broad scale. It does not go down to predicting yes. the things that even happen in individual nations outside of Israel. Mm. So we really cannot even say that, oh, me doing A and B – is going to change C that's in the Bible because it's not even addressing A and B. Hmm. There's no way we can even know, based upon the broad picture we're given, that the events of, you know, let's just be sort of silly and say me getting up and getting a cup of coffee aren't already incorporated into that tapestry that we see in the Bible. Uh, I, t I, I mean, tend to think that way, and that, that is one of the features of Molinist thought, actually. Yes. Um, that God knows from the beginning – all the decisions that everybody will make. And that's why classically in the Bible, he's able to bring good out of what are obviously evil things. It's quite mind blowing. But if God is sovereign, God is the creator and he knows all truths, then it seems reasonable to hypothesize that he knows those truths from the beginning and can, as you say, create a tapestry that actually brings good out of our evil decisions. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it would be a bit like being a time traveler and right and <laughs> sort of placing little signs and things across history to direct those who would be paying attention to go the right course. Mm -hmm. But the end yeah. destination is the same. Yes. And this may be diverging a bit off topic. I don't think it is. But I think one of the strong Maybe one of the strongest reasons for us to be talking about these sorts of things, conspiracies and how to understand what's happening in the world mm -hmm. from a Christian point of view, both to Christians and non-Christians, is to offer them a reason why these things are happening. For the non-believer, you know, this world seems absolutely hopeless and insane, indecipherable at many times. We as believers, in talking about these things that are going on, we're offering those in the world who are lost in this confusion, in this chaos, we're offering them a reason why these things are happening. And in an indirect and sometimes even direct way, we're giving the gospel to them because we're saying, look, these horrible things that are happening, these things that are happening even maybe in your own personal life, here's the reason for it. And it's not because God doesn't care. It's not because he's indifferent. He told us these things were going to happen. And the reason he told us is so that you would have a way out and that you would have something to hold on to. And for believers, I think it's helpful because it gives us something to hold on to. It gives us uh, reasons that go counter to some of the explanations the world would offer when this event or that event happens. Like, hey, here's a reminder, fellow believer, 
this is to be expected. Yes. Well, absolutely. I've said many, many times on the show that what I'm trying to do is essentially pastoral. There is an element of evangelism about it, of course. You know, I have apologetics or, you know, theological kinds of discussions with people. So the motivation, part of the motivation with that is, of course, to attract people to think, well, yeah, maybe there's something here. But basically, my motivation is pastoral. You know, I have found rational discussion about these perplexing things so helpful in my own mental life that I want to do the same for other people. You know, I want to bring on people on the show who can discuss these things rationally so that whether they're Christian, non-Christian, people of other faiths, that they will think, oh, good, there's somebody that has the same kinds of worries and concerns that I have. I'm not alone in this. I'm not crazy. And my hope with that is that this therefore bridges a lot of unfortunate gaps that are artificial between people, which is not to say I want to compromise on my faith position. I think anybody who knows the mind renewed will know that I don't do that. I don't compromise on my faith position, but bridge those gaps that are artificial where I think the powers that be want to want to divide and conquer us, which again is not to say there are no divisions between us. There are divisions, um, but we mustn't let those divisions be such that they cause us to fight against each other. We, as I say so often, I use the, the illustration of joining hands. We, we, we join hands together in our differences, with our differences, and we march forward, hopefully, in trying to find the truth about these things. And it's essentially, in my understanding, it's pastoral. And I know that you think something like that, Mike, yourself, don't you, in what you do with your, your show, Fight the Lies? Absolutely. If, for me, if I'm keeping that as my central motivator, my central reason for doing this, yeah. then I always have to keep in mind, okay, if what I'm talking about is true, and I believe it to be true, which is my first qualifier. If, it, if I don't believe it's true, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to talk about it. Don't talk about it. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. But even if it's true, do I necessarily need to talk about it? Is it going to be helpful yes. in that witness? Absolutely. Um, totally with you on that point. Absolutely. There are things that there is a time and place for. And the opposite of that. If I've gotten into territory that may not be true and I choose to talk about it, I need to make sure that I make it clear that I am not putting this out as absolute truth, that I don't have evidence to prove it, that it's just an idea, it's something to question, something yes. to think about. Because what I don't want to do to the unbeliever is give them further reason not to believe. Yes. But what I do want to do is I want to come onto common ground. I want to yeah. say, look, you know, we're looking at, you know, for like lack of another example, 9-11. We're all seeing the same event. <laughs> and I, as somebody who believes in Christianity, I'm looking at the same event as you and I'm asking the same question as you. And here's the conclusion I came to. And I'm just going to offer this to you. And what I'm showing in that is that I'm willing to look at the same thing as you and talk about it versus the opposite, which is what we've been hitting on so often in our conversation is being a believer and refusing to talk about that, refusing to address it, and therefore just basically yes. turning our backs on those who are not believers and saying, I'm not even going to come down there and talk about yes. this to you. I know the truth and you're just going to have to figure it out on your own and your ideas. They're just crazy and nonsense and offensive anyway. So I'm not even going to have a conversation with you, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think people are quite right to be offended by that attitude. And insofar as Christians do that, I would wrap them over the knuckles and say, look, come on, we need to identify with people yeah, because I we're all people. We're all made in God's image. Whether people realize that or not, we're all human beings made in the image of God. We must respect each other and use the reason that we have. Yeah, I mean, the only difference between us and non-believers, and maybe I'm oversimplifying things, but the only difference between us and them is that we made one single conscious decision at one point in our lives. Yeah. And we weren't even able to make that decision on our own, right? right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there is no place for pride 
at all. Absolutely agree. And I was thinking actually when you were saying that about not putting out things that we know to be false, if you know we heavily question them ourselves, we state that that's we do. We're, we're just putting this out and we have questions about it. I totally agree. And I was just going to rather facetiously add that the only time I do put things out of false is on April the 1st. And I hope that some people have, have picked up on that. Um, um, I, I really, what I want to right at the end of our discussion here, make an additional point is that so often it is said that entertaining these ideas is crazy, um, irrational, it's irresponsible, perhaps even evil. I mean, there's been a tendency in recent years to say that conspiracy theorists are are, are even evil because their narratives might support terrorist narratives and all this kind of nonsense. But what I want to make the point from our discussion here is that we've been talking not just conspiracy theories, in fact, hardly anything about conspiracy theories in themselves, but the concept, what that might even mean. We've been talking philosophy, we've been talking epistemology, the theory of knowledge, we've been talking theology, we've been talking biblical interpretation. We've been using our reason, hopefully, (laughs) throughout this conversation, which I think in itself is evidence that this is actually a subject that is completely the opposite. If it's treated in the right way of being crazy or irrational, this is something that can be discussed and should be discussed in a rational way. And I, great thanks to you, Mike, for coming on to have this discussion. I've enjoyed it a great deal. And I think it's been a very profitable discussion. And I think, and I hope that we have evidenced what is the right way to to talk about and think about these things. So thanks ever so much for coming on. It's been a delight. And uh, I very much hope to have a discussion with you again in the future. You're you're a great conversation partner. Oh, thank you. Uh, It's an honor (laughs) being on. I I really am grateful to uh, be able to come on and have this conversation with you. I enjoy it. Um, I think at the end of the day, as for the topic... Really, what we're talking about simply is looking at the world and reality around us and trying to make sense of it. And if that involves coming to the conclusion that there is a conspiracy between people, then that is one aspect of that. It's not the sole aspect of that. It's like anything else. You, in science, you look at an observable event or object and you try to explain it. So that's essentially what we are doing. Absolutely. We are trying to look at reality and find explanations and share what we believe to be the arguments that are valid, we believe, for those things we're observing. If that involves a conspiracy, then it does. So if it it does. Uh, uh, so mote it be, as I will say, and, and trigger all sorts of conspiracies in the background. They're always here, Freemason, after all. Okay, no, I'm not. Uh, thank, you ever, <laughs> thank you ever so much, Mike, for coming on. It's been, it's been wonderful speaking to you. Thank you. 